My name is Anne Marie Schneider and I'm with the Institute for Public Policy and Social Research, our sponsoring agency at Michigan State University today. So we're here to talk about Michigan's connection to Asia. Thank you for being here. We had 93 registrants. So you guys get extra credit for showing up. <laughs> I know that there were some parking problems and there are also a couple of of hot topic sorts of issues uh, brewing. So we'll read about it in the news, right? Um, no fear, though, because we are filming the policy forum, as you know. Uh, some of you have been here before. So we'll be replaying this film uh, through public broadcasting stations. Thank goodness uh, we've, we've uh, had the foresight to partner with D DSE TV out of Muskegon it's been several years now. I want to say it's been six years uh, since we joined up and uh, really put public education on, on some of these current issues at the top of our list and made it our mission to, to provide some sort of understanding throughout the state of Michigan on uh, what's happening here at the Capitol. So we have over a million viewers of the, of the tape of the program today. Uh, we also tweet the program. Thank you to Cynthia Kyle, the Communications Director at the Institute for Public Policy and Social Research, and we welcome all of you to do that. And we have a photographer with us, Aaron Groom, who we've also been in a long-term partnership with, who um, will, whose photos will be posted to the website. And you'd be surprised how many gorgeous photos I have of you and you and you on that website. So you'll have to check it out. One reason we do it is to draw people to the website because the presentations will be posted there. And then a little bit more information if we, we know of uh, excellent resources to support what our speakers bring to the table, we'll post those on the website. So I, I just want to encourage you, uh, when you go back to your offices, <clears throat> Are your communities and you're talking about these issues if people have questions you can't answer that's a resource for them you know as you know michigan has been at the center of a good deal of discussion on the international front these days uh, we've talked about we talked about this for years but we are finally getting that new bridge uh, the NITSI or the nitc it's a bridge that will help link our country to trade opportunities between uh, Detroit and Ontario. We're at the center of discussion of pre-clearance at the border between the U.S. and Canada. Canada. These two countries have signed an agreement that will help move traffic between our two nations more quickly, more safely, more secure, uh, securely. So all of this conversation is, is coming coming full circle and is paying off in these ways. We've had quite a bit of international interest in locating uh, in businesses, international uh, businesses locating in our state with new arrivals from Asia and other parts of the world, Germany. Um, so these are folks who will be providing jobs here in Michigan. And as IPSR follows these trends in the relationship between state policy, uh, federal leaders, and international interests, we want to create a dialogue that anticipates the impacts of these trends and more uh, very, very specifically on the international front and how state and federal and international is coming together as part of what's making our world so small. So today, during our presentations, um, the, the, again, the topic is Michigan's connection to Asia. It's part of that facilitation of uh, international going on. Um, we're going to address really four different areas. We'll talk about economic development and business. We'll talk about on the educational front and global, uh, creating global citizens or global scholars, global workers right here in, in the state of Michigan. We'll also cover the geopolitical uh, landscape, which has a great deal to do with our 
economic development um, landscape. And finally, we'll, we might hear a little bit about agriculture here because it's so much at the center of our trade relations with Asia and not only growing food better, but growing more of it for growing populations across the world, really. So uh, speakers today have such a wide breadth of international experience and understanding. Uh, they are called, uh, called on to apply this insight to their work every single day. So I want to especially thank you for being here today and let you know how much we appreciate your bringing that insight to our panel. Let me tell you uh, about Siddha Chandra. The first thing I learned about Professor Chandra was that he went to high school in Canada. <laughs> Correct? So was that the beginning of your international experience? It was. There you go. There you go. Professor Chandra is the director of the Asian Studies Center at Michigan State University, uh, one of only two centers funded by the U.S. Department of Education as an All-Asia National Resource Center. So it really is a center of unique excellence in Asian studies. Um, it is one of the most prolific uh, outreach efforts in the states on helping people to understand Asian culture and, and the details of its geography and politics. So in, in general, um, it's contra Asia's contribution uh, to, the, to the world. Professor Chandra's research interest includes behavior and policy relating to addictive substances. His research looks at the drug trade from the perspective of economies, uh, health, security, and really the history of Asia. So he's received funding from the National Institutes of Health and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for his research, which has appeared or will appear in a variety of professional journals, uh, one of them uh, in particular is the British Journal of Political Science. His teaching responsibilities are in the James Madison College at MSU, and we typically have a number of people attend these forums who are graduates from James Madison, so uh, you'll feel right at home. <laughs> uh, Siddharth teaches a senior seminar titled Drug Policy from Asia to America, in which students learn about various aspects of drug policy, including drugs as a trade commodity. He received his PhD in economics from Cornell, his um, AM in economics from the University of Chicago, and his BA in economics from Brandeis University. Prior to joining MSU, he was director of the Asian Studies Center and associate professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh. So welcome to you. Um, our next speaker will be Jeannie Broad. Jeannie was with us about three years ago, so we've been getting to this, this topic at a different level for, for some amount of time. And again, much of her work then is paying off for the state of Michigan now. She's the Director of International Trade Management for the Michigan Economic Development Corporation's International Trade Team. And there are a number of changes taking place in the MEDC, given the governor's announcement, I believe just yesterday, of a new department on talent development to be overseen by MEDC. It's a very, very exciting initiative for our state. Huge, huge commitment uh, from the governor's office. And the mission of Jeannie's team in this mix at the MEDC is to promote Michigan exports to global markets. Uh, they link Michigan companies to the opportunities and the resources that support their export business objectives. So Jeannie is responsible for the team's field operations, international events, and partner relationships. Before coming to MEDC, she spent quite a bit of time, about, I don't know, 25 years <laughs> at GM in a variety of uh, business planning policy, public policy and government relations roles, as you can imagine, including 15 years as corporate uh, corporate director of international trade policy. She also, um, on, on, the, she, on the public policy front, she does market research and strategic planning for, uh, or has done market research and strategic planning for corporations such as uh, Sara Lee, uh, the Coalition on America's Gateways and Trade Corridors, 
uh, and also for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Urban Institute. She served on the Commission on Environmental uh, Co Cooperation's Advisory Panel on the Commission, I'm sorry, on Freight Transportation and, uh, and also on the Michigan East District Export Council, a position appointed only by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce. So she has a uh, very deep knowledge of, of our trade concerns and our uh, trade abilities here in this region. She has also served on the executive boards of the Great Lakes Chapter of the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce, the Mid-American Chapter of the German-American Chamber, and the Detroit Regional Chamber's former International Business Council and the Detroit International Visitors Council. And I believe that's where we first met at, a, so. at the uh, Economic Development uh, Chamber. So uh, Ginny holds degrees from Duke University, the University of California, Berkeley's Goldman School of Public Policy, and an MBA in Finance from the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. She was also awarded uh, in 2013 a certificate that comes from the National Association of Small Business International Trade Educators. And this is a certifi certification only given to uh, global business professionals of a certain caliber. So congratulations to you on, on that accomplishment. Okay, I feel like I've been bragging for the last 10 minutes on these people. <laughs> Quite a record we bring to you today. So I'm going to take a seat and uh, hand the microphone over to Dr. Chandra, and we'll talk soon. Let me say a couple of words about um, what I'm going to do in this presentation. Um, um, I'm actually going to focus on some economic and geopolitical considerations uh, in Asia, but give you a, sort of a very big picture overview. And for those of you who spend a lot of time reading about Asia, some of this may come across as being you know, very basic uh, information. For that reason, I'm also going to keep this presentation relatively short. Um, but I'd like to preface it by saying a little bit about what we do at the Asian Studies Center um, and why we are very grateful for the support that the state of Michigan provides to um, MSU in general, uh, but also some of the units at, at uh, Michigan State. Our, our mission is to promote knowledge about Asia, and this is knowledge through a variety of channels, including teaching, of course, programs of teaching, uh, but also t programs of outreach. We spend a lot of time, we have dedicated staff who spend time trying to get little kids in K-12 through institutions excited about and interested in Asia because we believe that as the future of Michigan, if they are knowledgeable and interested in Asia, I think um, the economy of Michigan will be able to hitch itself to some of the, uh, the more interesting and, and potentially valuable dynamics that we see in Asia today and that we expect to see in the coming days. Um, but also, we, we do invest a lot of resources in language instruction and instruction about the various cultures of Asia. And when I talk about Asia, I'm defining Asia as everything from Turkey to Japan and Siberia to Indonesia and everything in the middle, which is a very large portion of the world. Um, so we do provide languages of instruction. A number of our students are very successful. Um, they learn languages. They will do Chinese, for example, for four years and beyond. Uh, they will become successful professionals um, and also bridge builders between Michigan uh, and China. And I think that's going to be the focus of, um, of uh, both our presentations today. Um, so thank you very much for your support. Um, uh, and, and we do hope that uh, we'll be able to continue our engagement um, and our investment in, in Asia in Michigan. So um, what I'd like to focus on today is, is the importance of Asia when I talk about the importance of Asia is two considerations, and those are the economic and geopolitical considerations. I found myself spending an inordinate amount of time reading newspapers. I typically read about five or six newspapers from Asia every day because Asia is actually becoming a very exciting place geopolitically. It's always been, at least in my lifetime, an exciting place economically, but there are a lot of things happening in Asia geopolitically that I think should be of interest to anybody who's interested in engaging with Asia. So very broadly speaking, as an economist, I believe that economics is a force for peace and friendship. Um, if you have a strong bedrock of economic relations, 
then, you know, a few little geopolitical things here and there can probably be sorted out, right? The interest is overwhelming in maintaining friendship and peace, and that really, I feel, should form the basis of bilateral relations. That said, there have been some developments in Asia that are geopolitical in nature, nature and could potentially threaten um, the investments that we've made in terms of this, this bedrock in peace. And I would like to talk a little bit about them. And then maybe we can have a discussion about um, perhaps strategies to emphasize the economics and be a force for peace, um, and, and maybe to try and work around some of the geopolitical issues that are happening in Asia. So let me start with the two broad themes, economics, um, the size and importance of Asia, and then some trends, I think, that, that uh, some of you may already be aware of, and that is the reemergence of Asia, uh, the shrinking world, um, and then rapid growth and some emerging hotspots in Asia. Okay? So I'll spend a fair amount of time on that, and then I'll talk about some of the geopolitical developments in Asia, but I'll talk about them in a China-centric manner, because we do see in Asia the emergence now of a new military superpower. And that has all kinds of very interesting geopolitical, uh, geopolitical implications. So what is Asia? This is Asia the way I'm going to define it. All right? That's the outline. You see the Arabian Peninsula down there to the left with Turkey sticking out on the top. And we go all the way to the Kamchatka Peninsula on the right. That's up in the northeast. That's part of, the, of Russia. Um, and, that, and in fact, the bulk of Russia. It lies in Asia, the Russian landmass. And if you go all the way south, you see those archi archipelagic states. We have the Philippines and we have Indonesia. So Asia has everything that's encompassed um, by, by this region. I'm going to spend most of my time focusing on the area that is centered around China. Okay? So I'll talk a little bit about East Asia, a little bit about Southeast Asia, and then a little bit about South Asia. So in terms of economics, Asia is large. I think we all know it. The population of Asia, however, is 4.4 billion, okay? That's huge, okay? That's 60% of the world's population, okay? The United States, by comparison, is 319 million people, okay? So we've got almost 15 United States worth of people living in Asia. This is an enormous region, okay? And if you look at, I, I looked at a ranking of the top 10 countries in the world in terms of population, all right? And if you look at it, seven of them are Asian countries, okay? And, and of course, the ones that receive our attention are routinely at China and then India, right? Because these are the billion plus countries. But as a director of an Asian studies center, sometimes it's a little bit frustrating that we forget that not, not too far away from them, you've got these other enormous countries. You've got Indonesia with 255 million people. That's almost the size of the United States, okay? In fact, the US, by the way, is the number three country in the world in terms of population. You've got Pakistan, Bangladesh, Russia, Japan, okay? Enormous countries, and in some cases, enormous economies already. In other cases, countries that are going to become enormous economies, okay? So the first trend I think that's really important to think about is the reemergence of Asia. Asia used to be, it used to be the biggest eco economic entity in the world 500 years ago. Okay? And it was the, the largest economic entity in the world because most of the world's population lived there. Okay? So if you took the world's GDP, the world's economic output, and spread it out equally across everybody, the bulk of it would end up in Asia. Okay? And in fact, the 20th century, the 19th, and the 18th centuries have been a little bit of an aberration historically, where our economy, the United States economy, the economy of the EU, right, tended to be dominant and actually had a disproportionate share of the world's economic activity. What we're seeing in some sense today is a resetting of the world's economy back to that equilibrium, and an equilibrium that I would argue is natural because that's where the people are. That's where the activity is going to be. Okay? So by the year 2000, the share of Asia had doubled in the world's GDP from 20% in 1960 to 40%, and by 2100, it's probably going to get back to where, roughly where it should be, and that's 60%, because that's where 60% of the world's people are. Okay? So this is a region of enormous opportunity. Okay? And it's a region of enormous opportunity that's actually spread across uh, the continent. Okay? This is a slightly old diagram, uh, but this came from a very famous economist, Angus Madison, who studied the world's GDP. And what it essentially shows you is the beginnings of that reset in the context of the United States as a share of the world's GDP, and then India and China, which are the two largest countries in terms of population. Okay? And this trend is only going to continue and probably even accelerate. 
Okay? We know that China has already overtaken the United States in terms of GDP if you measure it in real terms, in terms of purchasing power parity. Okay, the world is shrinking. These are slightly outdated diagrams, but I like them. I grew up in the age of telephones when making a phone call was extremely expensive. Some of you probably did too, right? And then all of a sudden, it, it's, it, now it's free. I can Skype somebody in Asia for free. It costs me nothing, okay? So in the old days, this is what the world looked like. If you look at these rings, 25 cents for a three-minute call within this circle, just the United States. We're sort of on our own if we want to talk you know, at, at a low cost. And then there are, the, there are these other countries, mostly in the Western Hemisphere, Africa and Europe as well, that we can get to fairly easily. And just four years later, this is when, by the way, 1994 is when the first browsers got mainstreamed, internet browsers, Netscape for those of you who remember it, right? And within four years, what had happened, okay, take a look at how the world shrinks. The whole world sort of converges on the United States. In essence, it's become a lot cheaper for us to communicate with people. Right? And today, of course, it's the norm. If you see, if, if you see people, students, for example, in Michigan State, right, they're Skyping people, they're on their cell phones, they're talking to people essentially for free halfway around the world. So I looked up The Economist, which is, which is, in my opinion, a great news magazine, probably one of the best in the world, right? The most recent edition, the one that came in last week, I looked up the tables of economic growth rates, right? And they had the fourth quarter of 2014. They had data for that, right? And I said, okay, what are the, really, what are the fastest growing economies in the world? And there were a few economies that were growing at more than 5% on an annualized basis, right? I said, what are these economies? Five out of the six are in Asia, not surprisingly, okay? And four of those are among the 10 most populous countries in the world, okay? And what are those? Those are again, India, China, okay? And then Pakistan and Indonesia. Those four countries figure on that list of the 10 most populous countries in the world, right? So there's, this is where the action is. There's a lot of action. And to the extent that we can hook into this, I think as a state, it can really benefit us. All right. Um, this is a little projection. Uh, don't mind the reds because this diagram was actually produced um, in a slightly different context using the World Bank, data from the World Bank and Goldman Sachs. But what, what the left side shows you is gross domestic product, essentially the size of the economies right, of the world, right, and a ranking. And we have the United States at the top, China's number two, Japan's number three. Then we have a group of major European economies. We have Brazil, Russia, Italy, and so on. right. And if you look at the projected ranking in 2050, it's very different, okay? You've got a number of additional Asian economies, and what you'll notice is the economies that are large in population, China, China's now at the top in 2050, not just at the top, but at the top by a long shot, okay? Um, India is almost catching up to the United States, right? Japan, which used to, will, which is right now the number three economy, will fall to number seven, but it's still a big economy. Indonesia has pulled up by seven spots in the ranking, okay? Because why? It's the fourth biggest country in the world in terms of population, and it's growing rapidly, right? And so forth. So if you look at these projections, right, Asia is going to move up. All right. So having made that point, I think we, if, if we can engage with Asia, I think Asia, of course, has a bright future, but we also have a bright future. I think we have an even brighter future if you think about the impact that that can have on potentially diffusing some of the other kinds of issues that are beginning to make their way um, into the, the public discourse about Asia, right? And I think the biggest issue really in Asia today is how Asia is changing geopolitically, okay, outside economy, okay? And, and, and what, the, what the real, I think the phenomenon that a lot of people are watching, go and read Asian newspapers today, right? There will almost invariably almost every day be an article that somehow connects to this phenomenon. And this is the emergence of China. China is already an economic superpower, but this is the emergence of China now as a military superpower, okay? And what are the implications, okay? So just by way of a little bit of background, um, uh, so it's very hard to estimate what the budget increases are for the defense industry in China, but I think most people will, will tell you that the recent 
defense budget increases have been the order of 10, 11, 12 percent. Okay? These are much more rapid than the United States budget increases, which are the order of 5, 6 percent, depending on the categories that you look at. So this is a country that is, is already economically very prosperous and is essentially now developing military capacity that is proportional to its prosperity. Right? And we've seen this with the emergence of pretty much every superpower in the world, economic and military. Okay? This has happened a few times in the 20th century and then prior to that as well. Okay? Now, what comes with that, almost invariably, is a renegotiation in some way, shape, or form of bilateral and multi-rela multilateral relations. Right? And these renegotiations are happening not only at the global level, but as somebody who looks at an Asian Studies Center, much more interestingly, in the neighborhood, right? And these have, I think, very important implications um, for economic relations in the region, uh, but also potentially globally. And I think it's something that we need to be aware of. And I think we need to think about how we can use economics as a force to try to diffuse some of these developments, okay? So I think perhaps the, what, what's been dominating the headlines, and if you do Google searches on these, you'll find them all over the place is really, the, the, I think, the primary source of geopolitical tension has been territorial disputes, unresolved territorial disputes. Okay? So let me preface the second half of my presentation by saying to every territorial dispute, there are two sides. Okay? You know, there's, there are two, two, sometimes there are more. You'll find out in one of these territorial disputes, there are actually seven sides, and then a few more. Okay? This is the South China Sea one. But to every ter territorial dispute, there are actually two sides. I'm not going to discuss the merits and demerits of these disputes, all right? But I'm going to bring them to your attention, talk about who the players are, right? And then some of the implications as we've seen them play out in the public media, okay? So these will be, you know, this is what the news media is saying about some of these disputes. Okay, so I, remember I said we'll talk about three regions, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. So those are the three I'll talk about but with, with a China-centered um, angle. So number one, um, before we get into it, this, these are some of the more recent figures on the defense budget, right? This is from the Peterson Foundation. The United States still has far and away the largest defense budget, okay? And in fact, it dwarves the combined defense budgets of, of a, a group of the other largest countries, okay? I think there are 10 in here, yeah. So the next, the, the 10 other, the next 10 countries in this ranking together, collectively spend less than the U.S. dollars, right? That said, what you'll see is that the Chinese defense budget is actually very large and is expanding rapidly, okay? But more importantly, from a local Asian perspective, right, it dwarfs the budgets of its neighbors, right? If you look at Japan, okay, so Japan is number five in the world. If you look at India, um, also Russia, right? So the Chinese budget dwarfs it and is, and is actually projected to grow further. Okay, so we have this very interesting asymmetry developing in terms of capability, strategic capability, and that is also obviously influencing some of these geopolitical developments in the region. Okay, so let's talk about some of the territorial disputes. This is probably a dispute that everybody's heard of, right? And this is actually a group of islands that per se a lot of people might say these are just a few rocks in the ocean. Right? Why are they so important? It turns out if you look at the history of East Asia, right, there's a lot more going on than just a few rocks that stick out over the surface of the water. But the important point here is the most recent developments are, so the, the, these islands were actually under the ownership of private citizens of Japan, and in 2012 the Japanese government purchases these islands. Okay? And because this is a disputed area, right, China immediately says you can't do that. Okay? Because this is territory that belongs to the People's Republic of China. And by the way, Taiwan, so the Republic of China, has its own claim on the island. But I'm not going to go there. Okay? This, this actually causes a, a ramping up in tension. Okay? And probably the incident that I think in some way epitomizes this tension is the fishing boat incident and the rare earths crisis that happens. And this happened a couple of years ago. And what essentially happened is these islands were being patrolled by Japanese Coast Guard vessels. They got into an altercation with a Chinese fishing vessel, which was fishing in the area. The, the fisherman on the Chinese vessel, the captain, was arrested and taken to Okinawa, which is in, in Japan, southern Japan, and then was being processed through the Japanese legal system. 
Uh, when China protested and said, wait a minute, you have no jurisdiction over this fisherman. There's no, you can't arrest this person, right? And Japan says, well, you know, we have a legal system and things are going to have to sort of go through the whole due process thing. And what happens is, and, and um, so, so this, is, this is material I've got out of uh, the news media, is um, for some reason, and people argue what those reasons are, exports of rare earths from China to Japan come to a halt, okay? And China is far and away the world's most important producer of rare earths, okay? And these rare earths are critical for the high-tech sector in Japan, okay? So as the headlines are developing, we have a Chinese fisherman who's in Japanese custody. We have protests on both sides, public protests in Japan and China, so from the, the public population. And then we have this, this sudden stop in the rare earths exports, and then the next day, the next thing you know is the Chinese fisherman is back in China. All right. So the, the, the issue resolved itself. Um, one of the interesting consequences is Japan is now actively diversifying its sources of rare earth imports. Okay. So this is a very interesting example of two countries that are very closely interlinked. The largest investor of FDI in, in China historically has been Japan. Okay. Economically very closely interlinked. There's this geopolitical crisis that develops. An economic lever is used. It resolves the crisis, and the two countries move on. The South China Sea, uh, uh, I think, uh, issue is much more complicated if only because there are many more parties to this dispute. Okay, So here we have a group of islands. They are little islands. All these little islands, these little gray dots, are the islands that are under dispute. Okay, And different sets of islands, the Parasols, the Scarborough Shoal, the Spratleys down here, are being disputed by different parties too. By, by different parties, Okay, depending on where they are located and different differing historical claims to them. Okay. The important point over here is, so this is a map that I got from the BBC website, is, um, are you familiar with the United Nations, the UNCLOS, the law of the sea? Well, what it essentially says is, if a country has territory, right, literal territory on the shore, then essentially it is entitled to control over up to 200 miles offshore, right? And if you have two countries that are close enough to each other that you don't have 400 miles separating you, then you draw a line that essentially bisects that area so that each country gets half, right? And what this map shows is what the claims would be. The blue lines show what the claims would be, right? If they were made purely on the basis of mainland, right? Of their seashores, okay? The red line, it actually has many dashes, but it's also known as the nine dash line, okay? This line is, is the claim that the People's Republic of China lays to the region, Right? Based on the logic that if these islands belong to us and we think about 200 miles, right, then all of this territory belongs to us as well, at least in terms of the UNCLOS, this maritime territory. Right? Now, what are the implications for this? There are many countries in this vicinity. Okay? We have the Philippines, we have Vietnam, we have Brunei, we have Malaysia, we have Indonesia. Um, we have Singapore as well, but Singapore is far enough away that it's really not a direct party to this, this dispute, right? But the important thing is there are a number of countries, little countries in this region that also have claims. Um, and the South China Sea is an incredibly important body of water for navigation and for world trade, because think about what it links and, and what it links it to, right? So the Strait of Malacca is down here, this opens you up to the Indian Ocean, which goes all the way to Africa and to the Suez Canal and up to the Mediterranean and up to Europe, right? If you go up here, you're looking at three really large and important economies. You're looking at China, Japan, and Korea, okay? Which are incredibly important economies and very important in the world trading system, okay? So this becomes strategically an extremely important body of water. There are seven countries that are directly involved in this. Some of the key players are China, the Philippines, and Vietnam, right? And there have been some instances of the use of force, albeit very limited, to dislodge um, entities from representing these different uh, countries. Okay, we can talk about those as well. The latest development is 
China is now engaging in some land reclamation projects. Um, there's some evidence that an airstrip is being built on one of these shoals. And the latest headline just yesterday, I, I happened to Google it 10 minutes before coming here, is Singapore is now asking for intervention by countries that are outside of the dispute to come in and try and resolve this. Okay, Singapore is an extremely important member of the Association of Southeast Asia, Asian nations of ASEAN. All right. And then finally, the other really important territorial dispute in the area is the China-India dispute. And this is a border dispute that goes back a very long way. There are very large areas of land under dispute. Pakistan is involved. There is a whole discourse going on about a theory called the String of Pearls theory, whereby China has been developing a navigation route all the way to the Middle East, okay, for very good reason, right? Because as China industrializes, it needs a stable supply of oil, right? If you're not going to do the oil by land, if you're not going to transport it by land, you're going to transport it by sea, and the Indian Ocean becomes an extremely important route for the transportation of oil, okay? On the other hand, if you're sitting up there in India and you're looking at all the infrastructural developments that are happening along that route, they encircle India, right? And so India is getting extremely nervous about the geostrategic implications of the development of a number of deep sea ports um, in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Burma, and then beyond, right? And so that's sort of, it's complicated this whole uh, relationship that uh, India has with China, okay? Now, all of these countries do a lot of trade with China, okay? So let me end by saying, there is a bedrock of economic friendship and relationship between China and its neighbors, right? But some of the geopolitical developments, I think, depending on where they go, could threaten that bedrock of engagement. And I think if there are ways in which we can think about how we can make economics trump all of that, I think the world will be a better place. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I always look forward to coming over here, although this is just my second time, because uh, having a background in public policy, I'm always interested in these, in these forums. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, today on China, uh, primarily because China is the area uh, in, the, in Asia where right now the state of Michigan is put, putting the most attention. I, I might get into some of the other Asian countries at the end if there's time, but right now I'm going to start out there. And what I'd really like to do is talk about sort of the dynamics of trade and investment uh, between Michigan and China and why, uh, as public policies, the state of Michigan is, is promoting relationships between, uh, between China and Michigan. So, um, well, they're, actually, the answer is very simple. It's Governor Rick Snyder. So when uh, Governor Snyder uh, uh, took office, he, he took the position that China is extremely important. Um, basically said that in the 21st century, there will be a, pl a place on each continent that's the go-to place for making things. In Europe, it's Germany. In Asia, it will be China. And of course, in North America, it will be Michigan. So based on that, he has uh, taken trips to China uh, every year for the last four years. And the last three times, he's taken delegations of Michigan companies trying to do business in China. Um, the, between 15 and 20 companies each year. So this, this shows some of the places that Governor Snyder has visited over the last uh, four years. So you see he's not just gone to the places you're most familiar with, Shanghai and Beijing, but he's gone really uh, to quite a number of other cities uh, to, uh, to create relationships. Um, and then really when you get down to it, it's really all about relationships because in order to have trade uh, and communications between two regions, you really have to get to know the people, uh, do follow through, continue with them over time. And so Governor Snyder has actually had uh, really be doing a great job of developing relationships. Here he's in a meeting with the party secretary of Guangdong province, which and this particular individual is expected potentially to be the president of China in eight more years. So. Uh, it's important to develop these relationships. Uh, uh, I think the state of Michigan has, Michigan has received a lot of attention because we're here, we're interested in China, not just Shanghai, but all of China. Um, so what happens? You know, first of all, probably, you know, 20 years ago, uh, 
the big multinationals recognize the potential of China in terms of making things, and that China was a huge opportunity. We just heard that China is a uh, Asia is a huge market. Uh, Sixty percent of the population is here, and uh, those of us who those of the the companies that started looking at China back twenty years ago knew that although at the time there was very little trade done between Michigan and China, that over the uh, that is pre, it represented a huge opportunity going forward. So my background is in the auto industry before I joined the, uh, the state of Michigan. And in Michigan, the autos really began to focus on China very early. So when I first started working on China trade in the early 90s, I think that there was less than 300,000 vehicles being sold in all of China. Today, China uh, is the world's largest auto market. So what companies realized is that once China got into the World Trade Organization and the market opened up, there would be a potential large demand for U.S. products uh, and a huge market uh, to focus on for, for growth for U.S. companies. So basically, what you saw in terms of dynamics, the first thing you see is that companies started investing in China. Uh, General Motors was the first auto Michigan auto company to really get in there, but now Ford is catching up very quickly. So we see large numbers of foreign direct investment projects by Michigan companies in China. And uh, so what does that mean? Well, and, and just to point out, and th these investments are continuing. We have recently uh, General Motors JV with SAIC uh, just put another big investment in to make small cars. Um, auto parts manufacturer Cooper Standard just put a big investment uh, in Shanghai. But what this means is that once our companies start going over there and develop uh, facilities, they start needing exports from other Michigan companies to, to, to supply uh, for their supply chain. So when General Motors first went over to Shanghai, that project was approved around 1997, but they initially they were making Buicks, but they were importing kits of Buicks from Mich you know, mainly Michigan. So that created a, a large opportunity for exports from Michigan over to China. And in the first five years of that operation, that the value of those exports uh, from U.S. to uh, to China was about uh, three billion dollars. You know, which is you know a good sized number. Um, over time. These uh, these relationships uh, relationships grow. So today, um, last year, 2014, Michigan's total exports of products, and I'm excluding agriculture right now, were about 56 billion, and that ranked us number eight among all states after Texas, California, Washington, New York, Illinois, Louisiana, Florida. Uh, China is actually Michigan's third largest export market. Uh, right now, Canada represents about 50% of our exports, and then Mexico, but China is growing very quickly. So in 2014, Michigan's exports to China were $3.5 billion. So if you think about that, that a, a, a rep represents a, a huge increase in exports over in that direction. So And it's about 60% over what the exports were just in 2010. Of course, that was a bad year for the auto companies. Um, Right now, though, Michigan, if you look at all the U.S. states, Michigan ranks about 10 in, in terms of exports to China. So that implies there's still room for improvement. thing that we as a state are exporting over to China is transportation equipment, automotive related things, parts, equipment, etc. That's about 1.5 billion uh, in last year's uh, shipments. But importantly, uh, other, other industries are beginning to get into the game. So we've had chemicals, industrial machinery, computers, electrical equipment, fabricated metal products, uh, food manufacturers, etc. So there's we see many opportunities for a whole range of the diversity of Michi uh, Michigan's industries. And so the, the challenge is to make it easier or help connect Michigan companies to those opportunities for exports. 
So what happens when you start exporting? Well, another part of the dynamics uh, is that once you start exporting over there, you get to know Chinese companies, then they become more interested in Michigan. So they learn more about Michigan, what it has to offer. So basically, the auto industry has been a real draw to investment here in the States because we have a reputation for quality, for being able to meet global standards, for state-of-the-art technology. So this is beginning to attract Chinese companies many of them in the auto and manufacturing over here. Um, and if you look at uh, Chinese investment generally, right now, uh, Chinese, uh, the second fastest growing country of foreign direct investment, source of foreign direct investment is China. And it's the, right now it's the 12th largest source of foreign direct investment in the US um, and the only developing country in the top 15. If you look into Michigan, right now we have over 200 Chinese companies that have invested here in Michigan. And um, if you just look at the statistics, it's approximately $2 billion of investment. So when Chinese companies come over here, that means jobs in Michigan too, uh, in various ways. Um, the number one source of investment is in automotive industry investment. Um, but uh, we also have a combination of both greenfield investments, which are absolutely you know, new businesses coming to Michigan, as well as Chinese investment in existing companies. But that also creates jobs for us because uh, invest that can shore up companies that need additional capital and support uh, and enable them to retain, retain and grow their employment. Um, so again, 75% of Chinese investment in Michigan is in auto-related businesses, mostly components, but it's also in insurance, real estate, IT, medical devices, and others. And those greenfield investments are increasing. That's just a chart, uh, chart that shows generally in the U.S. you see a huge increase just in the last 15 years uh, in Chinese investment in the U.S. And you can also see how that little green column over in the far west, that's the greenfield projects, how that is beginning to grow very significantly. This is just a list of some of the major projects, recent projects in Michigan, and as you see, they, a lot of them are automotive. Um, the size varies up to you know half a, a billion dollars. But in addition to manufacturing, there are um, relationships with China provide other opportunities for also. Agriculture is a big one. Uh, we, there's a big demand in China for our dried fruits and blueberries and others, and so we're seeking ways to increase uh, trade uh, with China and, and agriculture. Tourism is, is a very important thing. Uh, Chinese tourists are beginning, because they are familiar with Michigan and the relationships with Michigan, they're beginning to come here, and uh, that creates dollars when they come and visit. So we're seeking ways to expand Chinese tourism. Right now in education, we have, um, uh, I think it's 6,000 students at Univ uh, University of Michigan, Chinese students, so there's very large numbers of students at both MSU and uh, Michigan of Chinese students, and uh, that, that creates another way to uh, create, um, promote the Michigan's economy. So what are we doing as a state to promote these relationships and this type of trade? So uh, as um, you heard earlier, I work for the, the, trade, uh, the trade team at, at MEDC, and so one of our objectives is try to connect companies to opportunities, not just in China, but around the world. But in China, we're doing a few specific things right now. Uh, three years ago, we opened uh, the Michigan China Center, and uh, we share that with uh, several other states. This center provides, uh, helps our companies make contacts and, uh, with potential customers, distributors, strategic partners in China. Uh, they will set up programs to um, matchmaking program, we call it matchmaking, uh, set up their appointments for them, facilitate translation, uh, help them with various problems and questions they have about exporting or into the China market, uh, packaging questions, uh, regulatory questions. So a lot of the, uh, basically hold their, provide that in-country, on-ground assistance to access the Chinese, Chinese market. Uh, we also do trade missions and trade shows. I mentioned that Governor Snyder has been taking trade missions for the last three years. Uh, we've actually had a, another one without him. Uh, we've also had a, 
uh, Michigan exhibit at Auto Mechanica last year and an Auto Parts show the year before. So this provides our, our companies an easy way to access the market and see what it's like uh, and while we're trying to hold their hand. Uh, we also have a, a dedicated Chinese specialist, Wei Wei Lu, who is here in Michigan and can help companies understand some of the complexities, what they have to do to access the market. And, um, and in addition to that, we provide through our, our network of regional trade managers, we provide uh, referrals and counseling to specialists all over the state, um, help with through the federal government, uh, our regional partners, private sector specialists and law firms and uh, logistics and whatever. So we, we do what we can to help our companies access that market. But uh, I do want to reiterate that a key thing is relationship building because in order to make these relationships last uh, over time, we need to develop relationships with Chinese associations, Chinese companies, Chinese people, so they, they know us and uh, do business. So we're focusing a lot on developing those relationships. So, um, but at the same time, there's probably more that we could do. Um, if you consider that in China, last time I counted, there were 99 Chinese cities that had over a million people in population. So probably by today, there's probably 110. But um, it's, you know, we're focused right now in Shanghai, Beijing, in terms of our services. But um, we're seeking out to find ways to help our companies in other areas of China, Guangzhou, which is down near Hong Kong, uh, other areas where autos and manufacturing are, are very important. Um, Aerospace is another area where Michigan has a lot of uh, very qualified companies. Um, we also need to really do more to educate Michigan companies about the opportunities that are out there. Uh, the, doing business in China is, is not exactly easy, but if you know what you're looking for and what kinds of business to look, to look for, it really helps things along. For example, in China, basically, as was mentioned, when you're doing business in China, you're doing business basically with the government because there are many state-owned enterprises there, and it's a little bit harder sometimes to do business with the state-owned enterprises in China than the private uh, companies in China that operate more like uh, companies that you're, you're, you're familiar with. So um, we, we try to, to provide the information and share information with Michigan companies about, you know, where, what kind of areas might be best, more um, open to U.S. products um, and to doing business. Uh, another area that is, it, it, since China is difficult, there could be very obscure customs rules and way, uh, sometimes companies need more, more sophisticated, uh, more uh, specialist sort of assistance. So we're looking for ways that our companies can find that assistance. But again, it all comes back to an enhanced relationships. So uh, over time, I think our objective is to continue to build relationships so that we can help our companies. Uh, as I mentioned, it's all a very circular thing. You know, we, we export to companies that attracts uh, Chinese companies to Michigan that creates jobs and, um, and it all promotes, I think, the welfare of the state of Michigan. One question that I had is, if you could give examples or an example of Greenfield investment. So basically when we talk about Greenfield investments, it's a new operation uh, that's being set up, like a new company. Uh, whereas uh, mergers and acquisition would be where, for example, Anstrom Helicopter, which is up in the UP, a Chinese bought that company. Okay. So um, as it is, that's, Enstrom has expanded significantly with that infusion of capital. So that's enabled them to hire more people up there and create jobs and they've gotten additional contracts. So that would be an example of mergers and acquisitions. So, um, so, yeah, these, yeah. Okay, very good. Do I get one of these? Absolutely. <laughs> so, 
since I asked the first question, I get one of these mugs that Siddharth brought along from the Asian Studies Center. We have some Center. souvenirs. If you ask a question, we'll Spoon. hand out a souvenir. And of course, they have a little bit of green to them. <laughs> This is beautiful. Thank you so much for bringing these. So I, I get a mug, and I'm wondering who wants to ask the next question. Hi, my name is Callie Nolan. I'm with 7C Lingo, a cross-cultural communications company located here in town, and also a graduate of James Madison College. Um, thank you so much for your very interesting presentations. One of the things that I was wondering is what is currently being done and what more could be done to prepare on a cultural level, not necessarily a technical level um, that has to do with trade or specific industries or even law for um, business back and forth between Michigan and China. But from a cultural and sociolinguistic perspective, what's being done here and what more could be done to prepare business people for you know, doing business across cultures, specifically with Asian cultures, or the Chinese culture and vice versa um, for so many people from those cultural backgrounds coming here to do business and live in our area and even for business people who aren't going overseas. Thank you. Um, what we're doing on the socio-cultural side is, you know, MSU offers the full slate of four years and then more of Chinese language to our students. We are constantly investing in courses and course material um, that are China related. Uh, we try to incentivize faculty members who may not be knowledgeable about China to go to China, um, to learn about China, to learn Chinese, and to work material about China into the courses that they teach. Um, at the outreach level, you know, we do a lot of work with schools. Uh, we co-sponsor a number of events in the community. We have a very large and strong um, a Chinese community within the Lansing area. They celebrate, they had a great Chinese New Year celebration just a few weeks ago. Um, so, so I think there are a number of ways that you can do it. Um, I think the university is doing a lot. Um, I think a number of schools within the area are also doing a lot. So our College of Education at MSU has a program. We work with Hanban, which is um, it, it's, an, it's an entity within the Chinese government, um, which invests in Confucius Institutes around the world and, and the United States. We are home to a Confucius Institute. We bring in Chinese language teachers from China, but we also certify and train teachers within Michigan to become Chinese language teacher, uh, teachers. And then they get pushed out to the schools to teach Chinese. So I think there's a lot going on. Uh, but I want to, what I want to emphasize is, as a consequence, there's a lot of opportunity for people in the community to take advantage of these assets. And please do. You know, Tell your kids who are going to schools that might be offering Chinese look, you've got an opportunity here, and this is a rare opportunity, and you're fortunate, and, and take advantage of it. But also, you know, the rest of us, you know, all the, the programming that goes on in the community, you know, take advantage of it. The, the other, I think, important way in which this works is, I think, Jeannie, you mentioned, um, you know, Chinese students coming to the United States. And, and I think one of the most wonderful things about that is we have a large community at Michigan State of Chinese students. And they interact, they sometimes live with, um, you know, students who grew up in Michigan who might otherwise not have had an opportunity to learn about China, but this is creating personal relationships. Um, so, you know, that bedrock of economic relationships, there's another bedrock of people to people, personal, interpersonal relationships, which I hope we can also work to strengthen to kind of try and head off some of this geopolitical, uh, you know, dynamic that seems to be developing. As part of our trade program, when we take missions over there, we will typically have a briefing for companies go over some key cultural you know, considerations. We offer uh, through our uh, the STEP program, which is a grant program that pays 50% of certain export development costs. We can have companies go through cultural training, uh, study some um, some language language training and to get some of that on the way. Um, but coming back the other way into Michigan, there has been discussions of how you make Michigan more um, attractive and homey, you know, for Chinese people. For example, hotels. Michigan hotels are necess aren't necessarily what uh, the typical Chinese traveler would expect. Like they like slippers in their rooms. So, how do you? What kind of small accommodations do you have to make to the hotels to attract uh, Chinese visitors you know, to the hotels? What kinds of accommodations do we make at our airport just so it's more welcoming welcoming to visitors when they arrive? So we were looking at all those ways that can make Michigan more sen you know, culturally sensitive it, it, itself. So, uh, and then back to the export side, 
Uh, we also help companies with translation of their websites into Chinese. Um, some company, you know, some, uh, and encourage them to have their materials in Chinese. And you know, so we we focus on the importance of the cultural um, sensitivity. Question here. Yeah, can you talk about the importance of trust? Uh, I know that oftentimes we're concerned about. Um, the quality of, you know, for food inspection and also from a quality assurance level in terms of parts, making sure things are, has there been a lot of work done by the MEDC and have, could you say, could you comment on the, the improvement in terms of our relationship, in terms of building trust uh, between the two countries and uh, this region? Hmm. Um, well, one of the uh, attractions that reasons Chinese companies want to make connections with Michigan companies is to, because of our relationships with um, global um, multinationals, uh, because of, uh, many you know, Michigan companies be, uh, are, are often used to dealing with multinationals, meeting those global standards. You know, again, in the auto industry, uh, the companies really want you to, uh, suppliers to be able to you know, service multiple markets and meet you know, various high global standards of quality and whatever. So the, I think Chinese have a certain degree of trust on the Michigan side of products, uh, where you have products being rejected on the Chinese border, it usually tends to be more political rather than actual quality issues. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, you know, there's, we've had issues over time, but that's a US-China issue rather than a Michigan issue. Um, that sometimes, you know, um, there's been continuing disputes over auto part imports and whatever with the uh, with China and the uh, U.S. is having to take China to WTO a few times. So, uh, but I think that there's one thing is when you're talking about global political trust, and the other is when you're talking about company to company trust. Mm -hmm. So we're making great strides on the company to company trust, but I think the global the global issue, and maybe you should address that as sort of maybe beyond our ability mm -hmm. to control. <laughs> well, I'd actually yeah. like to add to the company yeah. to company uh -huh. side. I think I think the Chinese government is also very keenly aware of some of these issues because uh -huh. they have at times become, mm -hmm. you know, big domestic problems. I mean, there was a big mm -hmm. scandal a few years ago about melamine poisoning with milk, right? Mm -hmm. And that was an it was a domestic issue. This was not milk that China was exporting necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's consumed in, in uh, within the country, so so I think there's some good news there. As the Chinese economy develops, I think China is internally also developing, you know, systems of standards, certainly in the areas of food safety. Mm -hmm. I know this personally because MSU. I mean, we have we have faculty at MSU who are working who work in the area of food safety who are working with people in China, right? Mm -hmm. So so you know to some degree I think this may also be a natural process as an economy sort of moves up the value added chain, you know, quality control institutions improve. And I, I think we'll see that happening in China. It happened in Japan many years ago. Mm -hmm. I think we'll see that happening okay. in China. Six years ago, I was prior to being a state representative, finding engineers for companies in China. Two big problems I ran into: one, every time they bring a laptop over, their database was downloaded. Secondly, um, the accommodations on the Chinese side were something that maybe they were used to, but less than what our people in Michigan were used to. And we had a lot of automotive engineers that were willing to put in six months, a year, 18 months over there for these various projects. What can we do to convey to them of what needs to be done to do more business between our two countries? What can we do to protect our people, our information, and educate those that are willing to um, work overseas? You know China is home to some very good economists and very yeah. good policy makers. I think we see that reflected in mm. a lot of the policies that the Chinese government implements. I mean, it has, you know, it has a great, great public policy and research capacity. And, and I think as a consequence, what, what the Chinese government recognizes is it's not going to be a low-wage economy forever. 
right? It's going to have to move up into value added at some point. This is what has happened to pretty much any economy that's gone from low income to high income, right? Now, what does that entail? What that means is at some point, you've got to change your mode of production, right, and economic growth. You've got to move out of low wage, um, you know, sectors, manufacturing. I remember when I was a child, my cheap toys were actually made in Japan. Okay, today, you're not going to find a cheap toy that's made in Japan, right? My kids were buying cheap toys that were made in China. You know, their kids will probably buying, be buying cheap toys that are made somewhere else, right? So what, is, what does China need to do to keep its economic trajectory sort of on the up? It has to move into higher value added. And today, increasingly, higher value added means higher knowledge content, right? So, so I, I think on the intellectual property side and the knowledge side, I think China is, is going to do everything that it can. And China, this is Chinese industry, the economy, government, policymakers, and so on, to embed as much knowledge as it can into whatever China produces in the future. So I think actually pushing on that front, you know, protection of intellectual property, is not going to be easy. Because in, in part, I think China's future prosperity rests on increasing knowledge content in whatever China produces. Right? Um, so, so really, that's the future. I, I, you know, I, and it's going to be very difficult to convince China that it should compromise its economic you know, trajectory, because that is really what I think a lot of the success of the party in China is based on, and the legitimacy of the party. So that, you know, it's a difficult problem. Um, in, in the area of reversing, you know, and, and political developments and so on, you know, I think China is also a very interesting country. But we are, we are, at present, we are still in the early stages of the new government, and I think there have been there's been a lot of evidence that there's been consolidation of power. Um, you know, we are seeing, for example, in an anti-corruption drive, right, which is I think widely publicized uh, in China, but also in, in the rest of the world. I think we're seeing a number of, of people who were uh, not just corrupt, but potentially also competitors and threats to the people in power today, sort of coming under fire and being essentially taken out of the, the political establishment. Um, and, and I think sometimes when a government is going through a transition like that, it can sort of tighten up on anything that might be perceived as a potential threat to its stability. But my suspicion is, once this power is consolidated, I think there's a chance that, you know, to the extent that it helps China's economic development, the government will begin to, you know, open up again. Again, this is all, you know, speculation. But uh. Yeah, and back to the intellectual property, the problem is if you're going to more of a knowledge base, you've got to have open access to ideas and information. And right now, scholars in China are complaining that they're not getting that. Well, you know, yeah. and this, yeah. this is also part of the discourse, right? Where yeah. is China going, right? Uh -huh. If it's going to need, you know, to develop its own intellectual property, what are the implications for society, for discourse, for the exchange of ideas? And what are the implications of that for the future of China? It's a, it's a very interesting, uh, you know, topic. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I mean, if we could predict the future, we'd be sitting somewhere else, right? Now. But one thing that we know is that, you know, we've heard this, it's almost cliche now that the world is shrinking. Mm -hmm. And all of these, um, you know, there are all of these dynamics, much of which depends on social capital, which, you know, you have a high level trust and that can drop way down with one incident, you know, like the, the battle, battle over the, the islands and so forth. So um, given the, uh, I guess, you know, it could be a volatile situation or given the, the dynamics, uh, the vulnerable <laughs> dynamics in the situation, it, it seems to me very important and in, in, uh, understandable why educational institutions are more focusing on creating global citizens, or as Dr. Simon likes to, likes to refer to it as global scholars. And I'm wondering um, if you know of ways that, that we're doing this in the state as a whole, and um, what impact that will have on the state of Michigan and deep down into the communities and the neighborhoods. When, when a business, a Chinese business, relocates to Michigan, what kind of impact does that have on that community as far as the, the people and the, the cultural differences that they have? 
Um, so when a Chinese uh, company locates here in Michigan, well, I think it just it adds to the richness. And so to the extent that it exposes uh, Michigan to ideas uh, and uh, equal, uh, from a different perspective, it's always a good a good idea to uh, you know, to broaden people's horizons and <laughs> ideas and perhaps gives them new ideas. I think it just creates the richness of, uh, of the community. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, as a former lobbyist, uh, when we were trying to get into China, we would talk about how the fact that um, if US companies were in China, Chinese companies would see American democracy at work, as, uh, the ways that we treated employees in the workforce, uh, standards in terms of environmental quality, safety, whatever. Uh, Actually, things like the open door policy in China, China didn't have an open door policy. So one of the strange things about companies in China uh, was that, uh, uh, and GM, I, I noticed that they had an open door policy, but nobody would use it because they we were afraid, you know, and the Chinese rather closed system would be a little bit uh, risky to do that. So you have to culturally uh, expose people to different ways of doing business. At the same time, I, I know in terms of Japanese coming to the Michigan area, people, Michigan companies learned a lot about Chinese, uh, Japanese business practices that went to make uh, Michigan companies more efficient and more um, look at things in a more, a different kind of way. Open, you know, the open workforce environment. That was really brought over by the Japanese. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you always learn things when you, when you, uh, start talking to people from different cultures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that China is, you know, we at MSU, we have such a large Chinese student population, and yesterday I was talking to the uh, Mid-Michigan Community College president, and she said, we do no international recruitment, and we have just an increasingly large population of um, students from India and China. And do you think that uh, one method of creating global citizens for China is to have them pursue their education in countries outside of China? I think absolutely. And I, I think the and I think the I think policymakers in China also see that, which is one reason why there are so many students from China who are studying, not just in the United States, but around the world. I think ultimately there is a sense that these students will bring back knowledge and certain types of change to China that will benefit the country. So absolutely. So, so this is it. It's a win-win, right? I think, I think when we have students from China or from Asia or from anywhere here, I, re I really think you are laying the bedrock of another dimension of the relationship that goes beyond the economic. It's a cultural understanding and interpersonal relationship that I think can help buffer us from some of these other kinds of developments. Yes. Yes. You, know, you mentioned these little shocks that can you know, affect relationships. It brings to mind, I, don't, I hope and I, I don't think this will happen in Asia, but you know, when I think about how the United States related with Russia under Vladimir Putin just 10 years ago, it was actually quite a warm relationship. Mm -hmm. And then at some point this whole, you know, this Ukraine Crimea thing happened and, and, uh, and, and if you look at it today, the relationship is, you know, um, it's, it's the, almost the opposite of what it used to be. I think, I think the good news for the United States relationship with China and with other countries in Asia, a lot of them, is that the economic relationship is much deeper, stronger, and more diversified. That I, I think that we have, we have this sort of guard against these kinds of things happening. Okay. We don't want to see a situation in which four or five of the world's largest economies decide that all of a sudden, you know, they don't want to relate with each other economically because that's the economic devastation that that would bring about, I think would be, first of all, at a personal level, bad for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But then it could also be destabilizing politically. Hence the need for global citizens. Absolutely. And Absolutely. educational exchanges. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think we've ended our time here. We have a few more mugs, a few more cups. So um, I only need one. <laughs> We're not going to throw them out at you. 
<laughs> but you will set them in the in the back there and feel free to, to take them until they're depleted. Please take what you learned here today and share it with your colleagues, refer them to our website. Our next forum will be on mental health and crime. So I, you know, I think it's it's a, a riveting topic, something that we're, questions uh, about which we're, we're really um, hitting the newspapers and, and uh, in the classroom and really in, in every segment of, of the community. So that'll be very interesting. Now, I would like to ask our speakers to give a closing sentence, um, but I'd also like your help in thanking them when they're completed, when they've completed their sentences, thanking them for their time and, and imparting uh, their, their knowledge and insights with us today. I think our economic relationship with China is very important. It's important not just for mutual prosperity, but I think also for a good longer term relationship that can be used um, for, the, for the benefit of both countries, not just economically, but culturally and politically. And I'd like to thank everybody also, and, and I think my closing you know, comment would be that um, a closer relationship between Michigan and China uh, can create uh, in, uh, trade and investment flows, which can create jobs and promote Michigan's economy, and so we could, should continue to promote those relationships.